Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Europe podcast available every morning on Apple, Spotify or wherever you listen. It's Thursday the 11th of July here in London. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Coming up today, once heavyweight supporters of Joe Biden go cold on the US president's bid for re-election as a Democratic senator calls on him to withdraw. The UK overhauls its listings regime in a major push to lure more IPOs to London. Plus, how bombs tied to toy drones are helping to rewrite the economics of war. We have a Bloomberg Businessweek special report on how Ukraine's low-cost flying arsenal is changing the way conflicts are fought. Let's start with a roundup of our top stories. US President Joe Biden is facing mounting pressure from within his own party to step aside. Democrat Peter Welch became the first sitting senator to directly endorse replacing the president and joins a growing number of House lawmakers in calling on him to step aside. Meanwhile, Axios is reporting that Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is open to replacing Joe Biden as the Democrats' nominee. And in a further blow to the President, former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi told MSNBC's Morning Joe programme on Wednesday that Biden needs to make a decision quickly. It's up to the president to decide if he is going to run. Uh, we're all encouraging him uh, to, to make that decision uh, because time is running short. I want him to do whatever he decides to do. And that's, that's the way it is. Whatever he decides, we go with. The sense of disquiet in the Democratic Party from Pelosi and others was further amplified by an article in the New York Times by George Clooney yesterday titled I Love Joe Biden but We Need a New Nominee. A lifelong Democrat who helped raise $30 million for the President at an event last month, Clooney wrote We can put our heads in the sand and pray for a miracle in November or we can speak the truth. Well, the president's domestic issues loom large over his hosting of the NATO summit. Biden called Britain the not tying the NATO alliance together in his first meeting with the new Prime Minister Keir Starmer. World leaders are gathering in Washington for the military bloc's 75th anniversary summit. The US leader noted Britain's key role as an ally on a wide range of issues. I kind of see you guys as the not tying the transatlantic alliance together. The closer you are with Europe, the more you're engaged, the more, because we know where you are, we know where we are in both countries. That was US President Joe Biden there. Keir Starmer, who agreed with Biden's comments, has also taken the rare step of bringing his European Relations Minister, Nick Thomas Simmons, to the NATO gathering in order to bolster the new UK government's relationship with European leaders. The UK's financial regulator is overhauling listing rules. It's part of a long-running push to to try and drive IPOs back into London. James Wilcock has more. We do not believe the status quo is an option. That's how the boss of the Financial Conduct Authority put it. London has been falling behind as a financial capital, with new rising stars like Arm choosing to list in the US. So now the regulator is finalising its reforms, allowing listings in dual countries, letting bosses make more decisions without shareholders voting, and opening up two-tier shares, moves likely to empower founders and venture capitalists. The rules take effect in just 18 days, but with growth being a central mission of the new government, politicians are watching to see if the regulator's changes deliver. In London, James Woolcock, Bloomberg Radio. Well, that new government has also promised to fix the UK's ailing public services, but an unforeseen shortfall in the national finances could make that even more difficult. Bloomberg's Tiwa Adebayo has the details. Newly minted Chancellor Rachel Reeves has big plans for galvanising the economy, but she may not have bet on a budgetary hole of up to £30 billion. Private sector economists are warning that any economic upside from labour policies risks being wiped out by downgrades to forecast growth. Government economic plans are rooted in a 2025 1.9% growth prediction from the Office for Budget Responsibility, but economists surveyed by Bloomberg put the figure at a lower 1.3%. Their warnings expose the precarious nature of public finances whilst the government tries to generate funding for the crumbling public sector. It's an economic reality which could make it even harder for Reeves' self-declared growth-centred national mission to be achieved. In London, Tiwa Adebayo, Bloomberg Radio. 
In France, Emmanuel Macron has called on parties from the centre-right to the centre-left to join a broad coalition and exclude the far-left and far-right from government. In his first detailed statement since the elections, the French president appealed to parties that represent what he described as Republican forces to build a solid majority. Macron's definition excludes the far-left France Unbowed party as well as the far-right National Rally. The statement also confirmed the president won't name a prime minister until political negotiations reach some sort of conclusion. Sunday's second round vote failed to produce a clear majority for any party. Now, Archegos founder Bill Wong has been convicted of fraud and market manipulation after a two-month trial in the US. The company's former CFO, Patrick Halligan, was also found guilty by the Manhattan court jury. The ruling comes after both men were accused of defrauding counterparties, including Credit Suisse and UBS, by lying to them about trading activity and risk exposure. Bloomberg's Vonnie Quinn says the case is a victory for US authorities. It's basically a clean sweep for the U.S., for U.S. Attorney Damien Williams, a massive success following on the heels of the Sam Bankman fried conviction. So essentially what the prosecution was saying was that Bill Huang in Archegos was running an enterprise, right, like any other kind of criminal enterprise. He broke the RICO statute. He manipulated stocks higher. He continued to try to amass capacity and levered himself to the extent that it was always going to be a wash. So that was Bloomberg's Vardy Quinn speaking there. Now, uh, Bill Wong and Patrick Halligan await sentencing on the 28th of October. Wong remains free on a $100 million bond, whilst Halligan is free on a million dollar bond. England's men's football team are through to their first ever major tournament final on foreign soil. They beat the Netherlands 2-1 in the last four of Euro 2024 to set up a trophy deciding clash uh, with Spain. Substitute Ollie Watkins scored a 90th minute winner to book the England side a place in the decider. Manager Gareth Southgate says he's proud to be making more history with his team. I think we've given our supporters some of the best nights over the last 50 years. So, um, But from our point of view, we're not finished. We've got the, the greatest possible test to prepare for. We came here to try and win the tournament and, and that's still our aim. That's England's Gareth Southgate speaking there. The final will take place in Berlin on Sunday, where the three lines will face Spain. In a moment, we're going to get more on the Democrats and even Hollywood turning on President Biden uh, and really questioning his re-election campaign. Plus, special reporting on Ukraine with an eye-opening Bloomberg Originals documentary on how the drone war is changing the economics of conflict. Uh, but first, I also want to talk a little bit about this stock market shake-up. I think it's really interesting that the FCA has come out with these new regulations. Yeah, these are new rules that are going to come into force from the end of July that are going to, well, the goal is anyway to try and boost the number of IPOs in London in pursuit of what everyone tells us the UK needs more of, growth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Look, it's been widely understood that one of the UK's um, problems has been the stock market, the lack of IPOs, the inability to get the kind of investment capital that the US does. The Labour government, I will remind people if they haven't read the manifesto in detail, does talk about um, a new regulatory innovation office, basically new metrics for the regulators in Britain. In other words, that they would have to show demonstrate progress towards their secondary objective of growth and competitiveness. So it's interesting that there is pressure on the regulators to do more. Um, the first changes, um, the, the changes that the FCA is announcing today, they first, of course, came up and they started under the Conservative government. They are meant to be the biggest shake-up in listing rules in 30 years in Britain, but the regulators have got a lot of uh, issues on their plate already, the new consumer mandate, for example. And the major question and I would say is whether it's going to actually deliver because a year ago there was also talk about the Mansion House Compact around getting much more pension money going into unlisted UK uh, companies. You know, 11 pension providers did that deal and that is basically the anniversary is about now and nobody's really come out to say that that has has been a decisive mm. win. So the question is, is this FCA uh, shake-up going to work? Yeah, well, of course, the results of this are going to be very closely watched. Let's bring you more details next, though, on our top story. And this, the Vermont Democrat 
Democratic Senator Peter Welch becoming the first sitting senator to call for Joe Biden to withdraw from November's election race. It comes as screen legend George Clooney has summed up the mood in Hollywood saying the dam has broken. Joining us now for more Bloomberg's managing editor Derek Wallbank. Derek, great to have you with us. So we have two op-eds pressing for change, one from a senator, another from George Clooney. How much impact will this have? Well, I think the uh, senator may be a little bit more uh, substantial than George Clooney's, although I can tell you that there is re- there are reports out that the Biden campaign uh, tried hard to prevent, uh, you know, Clooney's op-ed from coming out. I, I think realistically, though, what you're looking at is a bit of a, you know, a continued groundswell of skeptical voices um, of where Joe Biden is right now, what he's able to do, and, and candidly, a lot of fear. Uh, within the Democratic Party and uh, and other folks who are not in the pro-Trump camp, that Biden may not be strong enough to press the case against Donald Trump. Um, and then associated with that, questions about uh, how he would be able to deal with the next four years, especially the further out into that, that you get. All of this being fueled by a debate performance that was uh, less than satisfactory, shall we say. Uh, I do think that the, that uh, every single moment that you see Biden from here forward is going to be viewed in part through this lens, right? People are going to be watching his every move, how he acts, how he speaks. Mm. Um, and, and and all of that is going to take on a higher significance. Yeah, and he's due to hold a press conference uh, today. He's also doing a series of interviews. He did one with ABC. I think he's got one scheduled next week as well. I mean, what are we expecting, as you say, uh, from those performances closely watched? Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. You know, he he does have a, a press conference. It's going to be a really, really major event that I think the whole world is going to be watching, frankly. Um, and again, you know, th- this is one of those things where the president will want to come out and talk about NATO. He'll want to come out and talk about Ukraine. He'll want to talk about countering Russia. He'll want to talk about countering China, all those sorts of things. And what a lot of people will be watching for are any of those moments like he had during the debate where he, you know, repeatedly stumbled, seemed to have lost his way, um, go off on non sequiturs, et cetera. That's, that's going to be where a lot of the focus is. Uh, already that's not where the white house wants it to be. Let's start there. Um, but you know, I, I've said for a while now, and I would stick with this, like, the, the way to counter the questions are, are you up to the challenge, is to go be up to the challenge, right? If Biden sits there and has strong after strong after strong performance, I mean, really starts taking the message to Trump, starts to turn around those poll numbers, this is a problem that maybe solves itself. If he cannot do that, this is a problem that gets worse with time. Okay, Derek Wellbank, thank you very much for bringing us up to date on that story. That's our managing editor, Derek Wellbank, there. Well, uh, he mentioned that the US president might want to talk about Ukraine, and obviously NATO is happening. And now to Bloomberg's in depth reporting on how a $400 drone is rewriting the economics of war in Ukraine. Joining us now from Berlin is Bloomberg's Jake Rudnitsky, who's the reporter behind this exclusive story. Jake, um, I read the piece and I also watched the Bloomberg Originals documentary that has come out accompanying it. It's about 13 minutes long. It's extraordinary. You see the drones being made in the these workshops being tested, then deployed. How has Ukraine built this wartime industry? Well, one of the most fascinating things for me was to meet the people who really emerged out of nowhere to produce what has become maybe the most essential weapons in in the war. Uh, Alexei Babenko was literally a, a steampunk street performer before the Russians invaded. He started off with some duct tape, C4, and a drone that you can buy at Walmart. And now he's running one of the country's top five uh, drone producers. He's he's just 25 years old. Uh, Francisco Sarah Martin used to work on a project to send aid to hard to reach African villages by drone. Now he makes drones that target Russian oil refineries. There are over 100 drone producers that have popped up in Ukraine since the Russian invasion. And what they all have in common is they rely on off-the-shelf components, a lot of which come from China, and, and they're very, very cheap. So how is this changing the, the economics of, of war? You know, this is a decision about getting something that's very cheap and very effective versus 
you know, a $3 million tank. Yeah, I mean, uh, Babenko's drones cost about $400, and two or three of them can take out a tank. Uh, the most stark example is the Russian Black Sea Fleet, which has been rendered pretty much useless due to Ukrainian sea-based drones. So I think militaries are going to have to think long and hard about whether it makes sense to field these really expensive big-ticket items that can be easily taken out by something mm. that you make in a garage. Uh, Ukraine's... I mean yeah, and I was going to say that the other extraordinary contrast is the sort of technology, as you say, when Ukraine and the war there is also described as being a lot like, you know, the trenches of World War One. That's quite a contrast. Yeah. And I mean, for soldiers on the front, I guess that's an accurate description. Uh, the front has been fairly static in the last several months. Uh, one way it does differ from World War One, though, is that both sides can see everything that's happening, and they can see that for miles beyond the trenches. So it really lifts the fog of war. Uh, they can strike with precision, and that makes it really hard to mass troops or move big amounts of equipment. Um, yeah. And that's all because of drones, I think. Um, but for grunts, I guess the main effect is that you know you can't even hide. There's nowhere to hide now. So it's it's probably even more perilous than uh, World War One. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, your morning brief on the stories making news from London to Wall Street and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed every morning on Apple, Spotify and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning on London DAB Radio, the Bloomberg Business app and Bloomberg.com. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day, right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe.